And very simply, verses 16 and verse 17. I'll read these words, we'll have a word of prayer, and we'll get to our study uh, immediately. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. Paul says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Verses 16 and 17, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. God will bless his word to our hearts. Let's seek him together just briefly in a word of prayer this evening. Blessed Father, speak to our hearts through the truth of God we ask of thee. And Lord, give us a good heart that will receive the word of God, that in precious and grafted words of truth with meekness. Lord, there can be so much rebellion and stubbornness within our hearts. And Lord, we can be distracted by a multitude of things. Oh Lord, refresh us, revive us, and give us an understanding of our Christian identity, of who and what the church of Christ is. And Lord, how thou dost view the body of the believers which have been purchased by the highest price of all, by, by Jesus' precious blood. Oh Lord, speak to my heart and to all alike this evening. We pray in the Saviour's name. Amen. Now for a number of years, and, and probably over a period of time, but it's accelerated uh, over these last number of years, identity politics has, has taken hold of the world at large in, in many respects. And if you have any sort of insight into identity politics, you'd understand it covers a, a wide range of ideas and, and thoughts. But branching out from this, there has been a, a great, and we have to say a lamentable effort to try and form a distinction between a person's sex and a person's gender. It's ludicrous. We, we all accept that and realize that this evening. But there we go. That's the, the emphasis that we see in society. A person's own sense of individual gender is being promoted at large. And what we have as a result is a, a bizarre and a, a troubling list of approximately 70 genders that any person can identify with themselves with at, at any stage of their life. It, it would be laughable. It, it is laughable to some degree if it wasn't so serious, because it is serious. I was doing something very unprofitable, running through some of what these classifications are. And I mean, it's ridiculous that there's one that's called omnigender, that just simply says you could be any gender you want at any particular time. And the list, they go on and on and on. These, these views, they, they reveal many things. It reveals not just the, the depravity of our age, because it does demonstrate the depravity and the wickedness and the sinfulness of the age in which we live. But what it does, it demonstrates the result of when society at large and the church of Jesus Christ departs from the authority of the word of God. You see, where you remove the scriptures and you remove the Bible as the supreme authority within the life of the believer and the life of any nation and society, you have a void. Uh, and the devil will rush to try to fill that void with all the things that he can and he will. Well, we know better, don't we? Because the Bible is very simple and it's very emphatic when it comes to sex, it comes to our gender. Male and female created he them. Uh, that's what the, the scripture says from the very beginning in Genesis. Remember, our, our Lord Jesus ratifies that in Mark 10 and verse 6. When he reminds people, he says, from the beginning of the creation, God made them. God made them male and female. So whether it's Genesis, whether it's the New Testament scriptures, it's abundantly clear. I only mention this for an introduction and an illustration this evening. Because here in our next study, I want you to see that Paul is appealing to identity. But what he's doing here this evening, as you look at verse 16 and 17, is that he's referring to the identity of what the church of Christ is. There isn't speculation. It isn't guesswork. It isn't something that's left to the feelings and the thoughts and desires of any individual professing Christian. God has made his people to be a people. And he's saying, this is who you are, and consequently, this is what you are to be. Now, notice that in verse 16, what Paul does, he does in his usual manner. He says, know ye not. If you just make that more contemporary, he's saying, do you not know? 
Verse 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God? Do you not know that the Spirit of God dwells and abides and lives within you? These are profound questions, aren't they? These are very searching questions. And when you read, read the, the likes of chapter 6, and we'll get there in time, you will see that that phrase, know ye not, is something that Paul repeats time and time again in the likes of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I believe in Romans it occurs a few times and elsewhere. And it seems to be Paul's method. That, that, that as a way of correcting them and, and rebuking them, but building them up and, and challenging them, he's, he's reminding them, don't you know who you are? As well as the world sort of losing its head and forgetting what it really is, sadly the Christian church can do the same. And, and, and many of the problems that we see and we endure, we have to suffer and try to handle, that can be directly traced to this, this absence of the knowledge of what God has made his people to be. And so Paul, he brings them back, don't you know what you are? Know ye not that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells and abides within you? It's very important we know, we know why he's using this form of address so that we get the right form of application. Now, do you remember what he's been addressing so far? And this is where I'm asking you to go back in your minds. And that's not easy for me. So I'm sure we're all in the same boat this evening. You know, we can, we can sort of forget some of the things that we've learned. But, but only just of recently in, in the passage before this verse, Paul has been reminding believers at Corinth of what a faithful ministry is, of what a fireproof ministry is, and what it is for the man to stand behind a pulpit, and what it is for the people of God to occupy the pews and the chairs, and what God wants and desires his people to be, and what this ministry is to be. And Corinth, although it's been a number of years since their inception, as a local church, there had been the, the good founding influences of Paul and, and Apollos and, and Peter and so on. And over the years, other influences began to creep in. Now, it, it seems from the passage that we've been studying that some of the influences, that they weren't outrightly denying the faith. They may have been strewn with forms of error, but they were akin to hay and wood and stubble, Paul makes it clear, the man may be saved, but just about in a sense. The ministry is all consumed. It's been, a, it's been a ministry where there's been a great loss suffered because some have crept in and while they've not denied something of the fundamentals, they've allowed elements of false teaching, things that aren't right, just to creep in. But judging by the severity of verse 17, as we shall see very soon, I also suggest to see if there were other influences that were far more destructive. And that shows you something of the peril and uh, the, the dangerous situation that Corinth were in. There, there had been this great range. There had been the good, godly, Paul, Apollos, Peter influences. And then as time went by, other influences where there had been a chipping away at the edifice. And now there seems to be others that had been coming in and, and their influences, their teaching, what they promote, it's destructive, it's, it's defiling the very temple of God. All of this is in Paul's mind. I, I really don't know as a, as a man how he dealt with it. The Lord obviously gave him much grace. It must have been incredibly challenging. It must have been a hard letter to write, to, to deal with, think about it this evening. What he does here, as he, as he addresses the church of Jesus Christ and the people of God, he says, don't you know who you are? Don't, don't you know what you're to be by, in, in the fear of God? It's not just simply that he's, he's going to correct the error and point out the sin, but he's going to bring them back to what they must be. Know ye not. He says in verse 16, that ye are the temple of God, and don't you know the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? So when we look at these verses, as I've always tried to do in, in the church here, what are we looking at? We're looking at Christian identity. We're looking at what the church of Christ is by the grace of God. And there are a few things that we can see this evening as we finish. First of all, as part of our identity, we are built up by God. We are built up by God. Verse 16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God. Just, just let those words sink into your hearts and thoughts this evening. As I let them sink into my heart this evening. Ye are the temple of God. 
Now, you only have to go back to verse 9, beloved, this evening, to see that Paul had already introduced his theme. Do you remember it? Look at verse uh, 9. He says, you're, you're God's husbandry. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. You're, you're his vine. You're his field. You're, you're his handiwork. And, and, and now as he develops this and he advances this even more, he says, you're the, you're the building of God. Now, notice something very important here. And I mentioned gender politics and we've got bizarre things of pronouns going around in society these days. But, but this is a, a good usage of pronouns. He says, ye, and the word ye there is in plural. So he is addressing the collective body of saints. Okay? He is referring to the whole corporate body of believers. And it's important we understand that because later in chapter 6, he's going to call upon the language of, of temple when he refers to individual believers and their bodies. And he says, your bodies are temples in which God dwells, and that's true. But, but right here in front of us, he's not dealing so much with the individual believer, which he will do with in time, but he's still addressing God's people collectively. He's, as it were, if he was standing here, he's addressing all of us here in Newton Arts and all of the professing believers throughout this world. And he says, collectively, ye, it's plural, ye are the temple of God. So it's important we see that this evening before we go any further. As the visible body of believers, they are this. Now, why is that remarkable? Do you know why it's remarkable? Because think about the strife. Think about the division. You know, think about the, the sin that was plaguing Corinth at this time. I mean, we haven't even begun to start with, you know, start where Paul goes on in, the, in these chapters. And it, and it'll be good for us as we journey forward into the letter to always keep hold of this. You're the temple of God, he says. So Paul's method of rebuke, because it is a rebuke, and we shouldn't lose sight of that as well as directly addressing the grave problems, is to bring them back to principal truths. Now that, I believe, sometimes is missing in Christendom. It's easy to point out the error and the sin and the wickedness. Well, that's right, we should do that, and we should highlight that. But, but the, the pastor's role as well, and, and the role of any ministry, is, is to, to remind us, this is what you are. I mean, I, I don't know if families do that, but it's, you know, it's an approach we can make in homes, you know, you can, you can say it to your son and daughter if they've, if they've done something wrong. You know, you don't do that because it's wrong. And then you remember your brothers and sisters. We're not strangers, we're, we're family. And there's two approaches here. You denounce the sin, the things that's wrong, but you also build them up. And that's what Paul is doing here. Because what is the Christian after all? And what is the church? The church of Jesus Christ is not a body of people who make up their own rules. Is it? It's not what we are, is it, this evening? It's not, it's not where we go our own way. The, the church of Jesus Christ is not uh, a people that adjust themselves according to how they feel on any given occasion. This doesn't feel right, so we'll do something different. My word, if we did that, what a mess we'd be in. If we were subject to our feelings, we could be anything, any time of the day. No, we are God's building and we are God's temple. And I believe that was a profound statement because in ancient Corinth, temples and shrines abounded, didn't they? There was, a, there was a temple for everything and a shrine for this and a shrine for that. Shrines to Athena, Poseidon, and many more besides. And, and for these early Christians who had come to the Savior and were living for Christ, well, that was no small thing to live in ancient Corinth with, with all of its wealth and philosophy and its knowledge and its influence, but all of this hedonism an idolatry. You're not a shrine to Poseidon or a shrine to Diana or whatever else it might have been. No, you're God's temple. You're the, you're the building of the living God. Oh, that would just hold us this evening and, and, and grip us and change us as it needs to. But it seems they had forgotten this. And you know that it's easy for the evangelical church to miss what God calls us to be that we are people called out unto him, that we are his temple, we are his body, we are his people. 
that we belong to the Creator and Redeemer through Christ. And so when Paul is addressing their division, their party spirit, their preference for individuals, he's highlighting something so vital. You've lost sight of what you are, and you've lost sight of Christ as the head of his church. So when we think of our identity, we are built up as the temple of God. But then notice something else, beloved, this evening. As part of our identity as, as the Christian church, we are, there in, we are then indwelt by God. We're indwelt by God. Isn't it amazing? Can you just think about that this evening? I, I, the more I thought about it earlier on, the more amazed I, I, I was by these words. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells and lives and abides in you. You know, I'm convinced that the biblical teaching surrounding the indwelling of God's Spirit, both in the individual life of the Christian, because it's also true, he indwells us personally, and the indwelling of the Spirit of God in the vital life of the church, corporately, because that's what Paul is dealing with here, is not only a neglected truth, because it is, but it's a misunderstood one. And in our misunderstanding, in our neglect of it, I'm not accusing them of saving, I'm just speaking broadly here, we, we lose out in so much because this is staggering. This is staggering. The almighty God indwells his people. And he indwells the company of people. I will meet with you. And you know, our, our Bible studies and our prayer meetings, and I'll, I'll put my hand in the air before anyone else, it can be hard sometimes, week after week, week after week. Especially when you get back to work, back to your routines, when tonight comes, Sunday evening, Sunday mornings, just keep on, keep on going, keep, keep, keep going. Why, why keep on going? Because God will be with us. He, he dwells among us. Not because we have to go to church. Because he says, I'll be with you. That's what he's saying here. He dwells us as a company of saints by the Holy Spirit of God. And you know you can go all the way back to Old Testament scriptures to establish that. What, what is the promise of our Lord to, to Israel to his, and to his people? Exodus 29, 45, I would dwell among the children of Israel and be their God. Trace that theme throughout the Old Testament. You get to Ezekiel 36, 27, and the Lord now develops that because he says, I will dwell among them by my Holy Spirit. And then you get to the likes of the ministry of our blessed Saviour in John chapter 14, especially. And, and the Lord, time and time again, he's reminding them, even though I leave, even though I go and off myself, I'll send another comforter. The Father will send it in my name. He will dwell among you. He will be with you. And you get that throughout the whole New Testament scripture. And that's what Paul emphasizes to, to erring churches, to a church is lacking comfort and strength to, to those tried and cast down. You get back to this, that when you come together, albeit in the midst of all your trials and, and, and needs, there is one thing that marks the body of the people. Of, there's, there's one thing that identifies us. God is with his people. And we know it. Because it's not just any ordinary gathering. And Paul emphasizes and he says, you're God's temple but a temple is a building that must be lived in. Imagine, you know, building a house and never moving in. And, and, and having a wonderful structure outside and it, and it never being lived in. It never being a home, just remaining a house. Building such as we have here in, in this lovely church that we have, church building that is. They're, they're great assets and we thank God for them. We thank God for the, 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 the sacrifice of many many people over the years, and, and you know more than I do the history of, the, of our church here, and you know what it went from one thing to another, we, we marvel at these things. But you know, if, if, all, if all it was was just an admiring of four walls and plaster and de decoration, and, and no one was here, it would be nothing, would it? No point in having it. God has given the church preachers to establish the foundation and establish the assembly of the saints of God. And that's what Paul is saying in these three chapters. It's not by me and it's not by Apollos. God has given the increase. You're, you're the temple of God. Now we'll get to this in time, but you'll start to see the angle that he's now developing. You see all that God has done. So why are you allowing people in? 
to defile this temple? And why are you allowing division within to destroy this temple? Why are you doing that? That's, that's the theme of Paul's message here. For many who came from Jewish backgrounds within the fellowship, they instantly would think of the Jewish temple in more ancient times where God through his Shekinah, or that just means the, the dwelling glory of God, was manifest among his people. It's one of the indispensable reasons why the people of God meet together in person, because God chooses to be with us. That's one of the reasons why we come together. It's, it's, it's what singles the fellowship of the saints out, because God says, I will put my spirit within you, I'll dwell with you. Know ye not, verse 16, you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. He's speaking of the church corporately, okay? What we are this evening. And then lastly, as we finish this evening, as part of our identity, we are set apart by God. We are built up, we are indwelt, and then we are set apart by God. Verse 17 is, remark, is remarkable, and it's, and it's very thought-provoking as well. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy it. So what we find now is having brought the church back to what they are as God's temple, Paul drives home application. So we need verse 16 so we understand verse 17. If, if any man defiles, God shall destroy. Now notice something, you don't see it here in English, you only see it in the original Greek, but defile and destroy are one and the same word in the Greek. So they're very simply, they're interchangeable. They, they mean the same thing just that we have different English renderings here. And, and it means to corrupt, or it means to bring into a worse condition or a worse state. So whether it's defile or whether it's destroy, it's the same thing Paul is saying here. Uh, my question is, what does it mean? And who is this man or this reference to a person or individuals that de defile the temple? Maybe, much like myself, we, we tend to read those words and we instantly just think of ourselves, we're defiling our own bodies. Well, Yes, we can do that, and we'll deal with that in chapter 6. But that's not the, the meaning here. It, it, it's Paul safeguarding the fellowship of the saints. It's Paul protecting the pulpit in a sense. It's Paul safeguarding the preaching of the gospel and the testimony. And if any man comes along, you see that there had been in-house fighting, division, destroying, disharmony, all of these other things. And, and that behavior grieved the Spirit of God. And that was contrary to their calling because they're to be holy. Look at the end of verse 17. You're a holy people. But that's not the primary meaning here. The primary meaning is to warn those particular teachers and influences who had come among this congregation and they'd sown so much error and Paul is saying, get away. You're defiling the people of God. You're defiling God's temple. And he fires a, a shot here, a warning across them. If any man, if anyone comes preaching any other gospel or doctrines contrary to the, the word of God and exerts a destructive, defiling influence. Now I don't know how, I don't know why, I don't know in what way this will manifest itself, but Paul lays down the great warning and he says, him shall God destroy. Whether it's left to the day of the Lord itself and all the vengeance and judgment that shall come from God, I, I, I can't say, I imagine it is. But the warning is there, it's as clear as day. It was Charles Hodge who said this, the temple cannot be injured with impunity. I, I know there are many people that wish and try to defile and rob the church, what it is, and corrupt its teachings and, and draw it. Another. It will never do this, they will never do this with impunity, that there will be consequences to such things. And because there are, it just impresses upon us all the more the need to keep holy what we have and hold fast to what we are in Christ. Remember this, in the Old Testament and under Mosaic law, you'll read in Leviticus and other places, that defiling the sanctuary was met with severe punishment, even death. Severe punishment. Casting out the people. Death, as I said. You have to ask yourself the question, if that was the law surrounding the physical sanctuary, how much more the living sanctuary and the living assembly of the saints of God? You know, it, it reminds me, even if it's an indirect application here, of how much regard God has for his people. 
Isn't it, isn't it wonderful? The regard that God has for his own people. You're my temple. I've bought you. I've purchased you. I've set you apart. You're sanctified. I endo- I, he does all of this. He puts his spirit within us. He, 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 he's pleased to dwell among us. And then what? We can't pray. We can't pray. We can't want study his word. We can't go out and live for him. And he's done all of this. I'm, I've done all this for you. And, I, and, and I'm dwelling you by my spirit. This is the love he has for the church. This is what he does for his people. This is the regard he has. And so with the same jealousy and zeal and love, we must protect it and guard it. If any man, verse 17, defile this temple, what a warning, him shall God destroy. Paul's words are intended to both warn anyone engaging in such actions and to stimulate the true believer back to a life pleasing to God. Because at this stage, the believers in Corinth were, were not where they need to be. But this was a spark. Maybe this evening we need that spark. Maybe it's been a long summer so far, after the back of a hard winter and a difficult few years. But just remember this one single thing. You are the temple of God. And as we come together as professing saints, he's pleased to indwell us by his Holy Spirit. May God bless these few thoughts.